If you were on a dance floor in the 1970s and 1980s, I am sure, like me, you danced to the music of our next guest, the incredible Martha Wash. Martha, welcome. Thank you so much. I got to tell you, there has been many a night when I was shirtless and tennis shoes on Ooh. a dance floor listening to you sing. This, okay. is, this is a great privilege <laughs> for me. <laughs> Thank Did you. you ever think that you would be called the iconic or the legendary Martha Wash? No. No, not at all. Not at all. I just, I just sang, uh -huh. you know. I just like to sing. Yeah. Now, uh, t uh, for those who don't know uh, your bio and and your history as a performer, where'd you come from? How'd you end up here? Well, I was born and raised right here in San Francisco. Uh huh. And um, uh, started singing background for Sylvester. Uh huh. And moved on to uh, uh, Two Tons of Fun. We recorded our first. Well, we recorded two albums, then moved on from that into the Weather Girls, right. and then on into a, a, a solo career. Now, your solo career has grown and grown, and you've got a new album out right now. Tell yes. us about that. Uh, the title of the CD is called Something Good, and um, the first single off of that is uh, I've Got You, which uh, did very well uh, as far as YouTube viewership, and um, we're going into the next single, which would be um, It's My Time. Now, I said that uh, today I was watching the video of uh, your new song mm -hmm. with my husband and made him cry, and I got kind of misty, too. And you said that that's been the reaction from a lot of people. That has been the reaction from a lot of people. Um, some of my friends uh, and some people on Facebook, they say, I'm sitting here watching this video and I'm just in tears it moves me so much you know and I'm saying good that's that's what we want to hear mm -hmm. about how uh, that song in particular relates to you how it makes you feel you know sometimes you do things and uh, videos and something and it's, it's like you want the other person to feel a certain type of way but we just kind of leave it up to the viewer who's watching it to get their own interpretation of the song because it's that song in particular is it can be in a natural uh, uh, state as far as a friendship uh, a family member something like that or it can be on a spiritual level it just says I've got you I know where you are I've got you it's okay you know. Now, you have just been awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the AIDS Emergency Fund celebrating, well, celebrating is a strange word, but commemorating <laughs> 30 years of helping people living with AIDS and, and HIV. Um, what did that feel like, Lifetime Achievement Award? Um, very strange for me because I'm, I know I've been doing this for quite a, quite a while, but it doesn't seem like, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. It was just wonderful, wonderful. Uh, the place was just fabulous, fabulous people. Um, and they just, I'm just totally honored that mm -hmm. they felt like they wanted to do this. Right, but now I mean, the reason is because you've been more than just a, a fabulous singer. You've been out there singing and performing and using your celebrity for good causes, especially causes for the LGBT community and the AIDS HIV right. community for a long time. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, your, your connection to the AIDS Emergency Fund is not just this event. Well, I've been doing this for so long, and I always say I wish I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. I wish no, no, nobody had to do this. And I remember starting well over 25 years ago when, when uh, HIV and AIDS was, first became very, very prominent. And organizations, little grassroots organizations from different cities were calling us and saying, would you please come and perform and help us raise money for our organization? And these were just little small grassroots organizations for places that needed uh, uh, hospice care. They were trying to raise money for that. And people that needed uh, uh, housing, they had nowhere to go. So starting from there, and seeing all these many years later, it's still going on. I hate it, but it has to be done. Right. It has to be done because there's still a lot of people out there that need help tremendously. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of stunning to me that an organization that has 
and continues to do such great work, like the AIDS Emergency Fund, yeah. is 30 years old. I remember the first time I heard the word AIDS in the summer of 1981. Yeah. And then, you know, as a young gay boy and hearing, well, this was sexually transmitted, you didn't know how you got it, I was like, well, I'm not going to be around in, in 30 years, and here we are still fighting this disease. Yeah, it was a really crazy time then because, as you say, nobody knew where it came, came from, how it was contracted, although in the media it was always portrayed as a gay disease, mm -hmm. which was not true, you know, because I would read in the newspaper about people who were not gay that were getting this, and this was back in the 80s, mm -hmm. but people weren't really, really talking about that so much. It was on the down low. Yeah, yeah. well, that too, but also straight women, elderly women, mm -hmm. they were contracting this, and they were saying, well, she wasn't gay, so now how did she come up with mm -hmm. AIDS? You know, it was all just very, very scary. Um, not knowing what was going to happen, where it was going to go, and how it was going to grow, you know. But over time, I think we've gotten better as far as education. And, but all, that also still needs to continue as well. Uh, we still have to educate folks about uh, the symptoms and, and how to be treated and all that other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you find, uh, back when you started doing this work and and performing at fundraisers and also obviously uh, knowing a, a good many people uh, who died from AIDS, HIV. Did you sense then that the idea that quote unquote it was a gay disease made it more difficult to reach certain populations specifically like the black community, the African American community? They didn't want to talk about this for a while. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, they, <laughs> no, that was something that was not going to affect our community. Mm -hmm. But indeed, mm -hmm. it, I knew a lot of black people black men mm -hmm. in particular who died of AIDS and uh, it was going on in our churches mm -hmm. but nobody was talking about it. Well you know you, you bring up something interesting because certainly I mean you know I was raised in Richmond Virginia and spent a lot of time in Southern Baptist churches mm -hmm. with a lot of black folks mm -hmm. African-American families mm -hmm. and the communities that come out of those churches are incredible and I remember when AIDS first started in San Francisco, it was like, well, you're going to reach gay men, quote unquote, which tended to be white men in the Castro. Mm -hmm. You can put up a poster about sex and condoms. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you want to reach African American men, you have got to go through the churches. Yeah. So, I mean, was it hard getting ministers and church congregations to deal with this? They didn't talk about it, period. It was never brought up until some years later, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few years later, in fact. I think within the last 10 years, uh, ministries, have come on board as far as getting information out to the parishioners and things. But for decades, no, mm -hmm. you did not bring that up. First of all, you didn't even bring up homosexuality in the church. Right. Okay, let alone HIV and AIDS. Right. Do you think you're an activist? Or you think you're more of an activist or more of an artist? I think I'm more of an artist. I think I'm more of an artist. Some people say I would be an activist, but no. Mm -hmm. I think I'm more of an artist. My, I think my activism is in my artistry. Right, right, right. You know? Now, this, this new album is clearly a, a labor of love and is getting great reviews and whatnot. Um, you know, getting a Lifetime Achievement Award makes some people think, well, Martha's not going to be singing anymore, but that's not the case, correct? <laughs> that's why I think it's so <laughs> interesting to get this Lifetime Achievement Award, you know. Um, yeah, I, there's still a lot of me that I want to do. Yeah. What next? Do some acting. Talk about that. I've read for um, uh, uh, some pilot shows. I've done some theater uh -huh. off and on over the years. Legit, legit theater on the stage. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how is that different from doing a music video? I mean, which is scarier? The music video, you don't have an audience. That's the main thing. Uh, being out there doing it every night for a different audience, that can be very, very scary. And what would be your ideal role on stage? Oh, good question. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Uh -huh. um, now, what have you read for? Well, <laughs> I just read for um, a, um, a prison warden. <laughs> 
Then I read for a parole officer. Uh huh. That was the last two things that I read for. Uh huh. Very strong, intimidating women. That right. Kind, that kind of thing. I think I could pull that off. Oh, I think <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it intimidating, <laughs> but certainly strong. I mean, I remember the first time I saw It's Raining Men, and I was like, "Wow, that's a performer." <laughs> oh. No, I mean that's a, you, it, it's a, a a big voice and no, you, a, a mesmerizing uh, presence on video and uh, and when you sing. I mean, like I said, you made my husband cry this morning hearing that new song. You got the pipes. You really well, got the pipes. You. What was your favorite moment in all the years of recording? You think? Ooh, of recording. Yeah, being in the studio is what I'm talking about specifically. It's funny because <laughs> it's funny because I don't like necessarily being in the studio. Not really. You don't like it. You you prefer live singing to recording in studio? Yes. I don't think I record very well. Believe it or not. That's me. Uh-huh. I don't think I record very well. I think I sing better live uh -huh. than I do in a studio recording. All right. Well, we're going to come back in the next half of the show. We're going to talk about some of your live performances and recordings with someone I know you remember and uh, I do as well, yep. the legendary Sylvester. Going to come back in a moment with Martha Wash. Stay tuned. Comcast Hometown Network is your home for Comcast Newsmakers in Depth, bringing you the news and information you need from the people who make a difference. Welcome to Comcast Newsmakers in Depth. Local I'm leaders Steve. talking local With issues. With the budget cuts mm. that are facing so many cities and counties. Yeah. Sir, landscaping, you want a safer environment. This is all about literacy. It's all about the kids. Comcast Newsmakers in Depth, Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m. on Comcast Hometown Network Channel 104. Our U-verse internet is frustrating because their fastest speed isn't as fast as Xfinity's. So we've had our entire house redone with stress-reducing materials. That way, when we're irritated with U-verse's speed, we don't cause any actual damage. If you had Xfinity, we'd be playing already. We're all much calmer now. Stop coping with U-verse. Awesome is having the fastest internet and now the fastest in-home Wi-Fi from Xfinity. Comcast Hometown Network is your home for Xfinity High School Basketball. Thursday, January 3rd at 7 p.m., the Midi Monarchs take on the Bellarmine Bells in an action-packed West Catholic Athletic League matchup. Catch the top teams battling it out on their hometown court. Midi versus Bellarmine, Thursday, January 3rd at 7 p.m. on Comcast Hometown Network. And we're back. I'm David Perry, and this is 10%. And we're speaking with the incredible Martha Wash. has a new album out called Something Good. Um, you know that old movie, Sound of Music? There's a song in there called Something Good. It always was emotional to me because it's about someone talking about, well, I may not have had a good childhood, but now I'm doing something good. Yeah. And you've been doing something good for a good many years. I've been trying. <laughs> I've been trying. Really, I've been trying. You know, I, really. when we were on the break, I asked you, and I'd like you to... Uh, tell it again, the story about how you feel about being associated so much with one song. It's Raining Men. Does well, that bother you? No, it doesn't bother me because that was the song really that kind of propelled the Weather Girls into mainstream, I would say. Right. You know, mainstream America as well as the LGBT. Yeah. Now, and the other uh, name that you're associated with, a very famous person in his own right, the incredible Sylvester. Yes. Talk to yes. me about meeting Sylvester and what it was like singing with him. Okay, quick backstory. I saw Sylvester two years before I actually met him. He was the opening act for Billy Preston at the Berkeley Community Theater. I was going to see Billy Preston because I was a big fan of his. Sylvester opened up his show. They were friends because they came from Los Angeles and had known each other and everything. Uh, Sylvester opened the show. I'm standing there actually with my mouth hung open saying, who is this guy? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, loved his show. Fast forward two years later, I get a call to go to a, um, a tryout for, I'm thinking, for studio session singers. Come to find out 
it was to uh, sing for Sylvester. The audition took maybe five minutes for me. Um, and everybody's heard this story before. There were two blonde, thin, white girls that had auditioned just before I walked in there. I came in, auditioned for him. He told the, the two girls they could leave. He hired me and asked if there was another large woman like me who could sing that I knew. And I said <laughs> yes, and I brought in Isora. Uh -huh. And what did you think of Sylvester when you first met him? Not that first stage appearance, but when you actually spoke to him, did you tell him about that story about seeing him open I for did. Billy Preston? I did, and he started laughing. I said, I didn't know who you were, you know. But as we started talking, come to find out, we knew some of the same people, uh, both had gospel backgrounds, so that kind of made it a whole lot easier. The keyboard player that he had just hired that was in the band then, I knew him because we had grown up together in church, so it was like a full circle moment. Now, some of Sylvester's most famous performances took place on the stage at the corner of Castro and Market, yes. San Francisco during Castro Street Fair and yes. Gay Pride. What was that like? Madness. Just, just absolute <laughs> madness. <laughs> But it was fun. It was just, as far as you could see, there was just a mass, a sea of humanity, just like, it seemed like 30,000 people, um, from the top of Castro and Market all the way down, was just people everywhere, everywhere. It was just so much fun. Now, what was he like? Crazy. <laughs> he was crazy. Certifiably or crazy, kind of fun crazy? Well, he could be certifiable <laughs> some, uh, on some days, but he was fun. He could be, uh, uh, he would read you sometimes. For filth? Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but yeah, yes, yeah. He, he would read you for filth, you know, if you got on his wrong side. But um, also still lovable. Also still lovable. I mean, you, ha you could be mad at him. But you turned around and said, okay, right, right. whatever. You know, yeah. I remember when I first came to town, the community was, you know, the, uh, the gay community, and then it was the gay and lesbian community, and then it was the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender <laughs> community. And I have to admit, as a gay man, I had never met, quote, unquote, someone who was of the trans community. Mm -hmm. And now Sylvester, in a way, has become kind of an icon. Would, would he have considered himself trans or uh, mm. of a different gender identity? I mean... Because I know I people would see him and say, is so. that a man, is that a woman, or is that just Sylvester? I don't think so. Uh -huh. um, he would, he, well. He would gender think, bend. Yes, he would gender bend because when I met him, he was, and at that time, I didn't know of too many guys that were out there wearing the bangle bracelets, uh, the, the rings, the caftan, flowy caftans, and things like that, and performing. So... Sometimes he would he would like to gender bend a, a, a little bit, but as far as doing the, the whole transgender thing, no, uh -huh. I don't think so. I mean, he was kind of, when you, when you look at those wonderful videos of that era, it's like, wow, if, if Liberace were hip and black, I mean, maybe that would be <laughs> Sylvester, I mean, you know? Possibly, <laughs> possibly. And maybe in his earlier years when he was just starting out uh -huh. and he was with the, with the, with the coquettes, mm -hmm. uh, possibly the gender bending thing might have been there, but I think as I, when I met him and on after that, mm -hmm. not so much. Is it hard being a, a quote-unquote backup singer? I mean, as far as, you know, you've got someone out there who's quote-unquote fronting. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like, well, you know, they're not looking at me. They're not listening to my, my pipes. Mm, I don't think it's hard. I don't think it's hard being a backup singer because, in my mind, I was always there to, su that your job is to support the artist that's out there in front. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if, he, if he or she wants to do all the singing by themselves, they don't have any backup singers, then fine. But if you've got backup singers, then I'm sure you want them to support you, lift you up in your singing, you know. That so I no, I, it doesn't bother me. Right. Some of the songs in that era, I mean, you know, like I, the, the movie Milk has music by Sylvester. Mm -hmm. What are some of the songs that we could hear you on that Sylvester recorded? I mean, Mighty Real? Yes. And people ask me, was that your favorite song? And I always said no. 
That was never my favorite song. What was? Dance Disco Heat. Uh-huh, and why is that? It's just so, just so fun and up-tempo, and especially when we did it at the, uh, recorded it at the Opera House. It was just, just stomp down, just stomp <laughs> down. <you know? laughs> now, of course, uh, Sylvester uh, became one of the early losses to AIDS, HIV. Do you remember when you found out that Sylvester was sick? Yes. Um, he called and told me and my manager at that time. Yeah, we, were, we had moved to New York by then. And he called to tell us what was going on. But it seems like he dealt with it very well. He was, um, I guess, resigned to it, especially at, towards the very, very end. But it was hard to hear. And in my mind, I'm saying to myself, okay, just one more that we're going to lose. Because at that point, how many people had you lost or a known lot, were dealing with aid? A lot. I mean, it was a black time, a dark time. Yeah. Um, one of our band members, Patrick Cowley, a uh, great writer, wrote a lot of tunes with, with Sylvester. Um, he left before Sylvester did. You know, there are a lot of people in the music industry, be between the artists, the producers, the DJs, they were just leaving out of here, and at one point in particular, for like a two-week stretch, just about every day, I got a phone call about somebody that I knew that had left. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you were here just a couple of weeks ago for the AIDS Emergency Fund 30th Anniversary Gala, the night before, you actually installed a, a boulder yes. in honor of Sylvester at the yeah. AIDS Memorial Grove, the yeah. National AIDS Memorial. What do you think he'd have thought about that? I think he would have liked it. I think he, it, it's it, it, just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous boulder. And I think he really would have liked it and said, okay, fabulous. You know. He, he wouldn't have thought it was too stuffy. I don't think so, because it's outside. Yeah. It's outside for well, everybody well, to see. Well, you know, I'm going to call you because in a few months is going to be another uh, memorial to Sylvester, the Rainbow Honor Walk, which is a, a walk of fame, as it were, in the Castro. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sylvester is one of the first 20 honorees. And when oh, his plaque great. is there, I'm going to call you and see if you'll come back and sing. Okay. That, so you better watch out. Yeah, okay, I'd love to. <laughs> in I'd our last to. few seconds, if someone wants to learn more about you, where do they go online? They can go to my Facebook page, which is uh, TheMarthaWash.com. Martha We've been speaking to the legendary Martha <laughs> Wash. I'm David Perry. We hope you feel mighty real. Watch 10%. See you next week.